to episode 228 of the Various and Sundry Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Harmon, joined live from the Vault Studio, beautiful campus of Grace College and Theological Seminary, by my good friend, my colleague, my co-host, and the man who is still recovering from his Mother's Day festivities, John Scott Sloat. Yeah, small grease fire, um, nothing to write home about. <laughs> Did you have a fire extinguisher handy? Did you have like no. baking soda? Like what? I just suffocated it. Okay. Just, just. Yeah, like shut. a towel or something? Like. Nope. Just shut, turned, the, shut the lid? Shut the lid, turned it off and let it calm down. It calmed okay. down. All right. Just burgers. So was there any meat harmed in this incident? No, there was meat cooked in this incident, <laughs> but not harmed. <laughs> Zero okay. meat harmed. Yes. That's that's important. Yeah. Yeah. So the, So the burgers were not. Irreparably, no, no. Hard. If anything, they had a little char on them, yeah. which uh, you know is hard to get on a smoker. So that's true. So that's we had, true. they were flame kissed. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 one way to put it. Yep. Okay. So nice celebration with both sides, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Both uh, both mothers were there. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. How about you guys? Anything anything exciting at the Harmon home for Mother's Day? Not really. Both our boys were gone, actually. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Boy, we I need to have a talk with them. They need to figure this out. Well, they were they were in Indy. And okay. uh for Jake's birthday. Was it his birthday or his Christmas gift? I can't remember. It was Christmas gift. Anyway. He got tickets for the two of them to go see NF in concert. Oh nice. So I don't. Yeah. I'll pretend like I know who that is. Yeah. but he's a he's a rapper. Okay, who apparently is Christian, but he's not a Christian rapper. If you understand that distinction. Okay, so he doesn't rap about Christian things. I think that's correct. Yes, but he may allude to them. Uh, maybe you got a Tolkien know. thing going on there. Just write it. <laughs> just write a good. As Tolkien once said, just yeah. write a good rap, yeah. and your Christian values will emerge. Yes, that, that's yes. sort of the idea. Yes, that's a token direct... on rap songs. Yes, direct <laughs> quote from his letters. Yes, yes, Tolkien unplugged. Yeah, <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, you're you're, you're getting ready to uh, hustle out of here. You... Yeah, yeah. I have a four o'clock fl- flight today. Okay, out of Fort Wayne. No, Detroit. Oh, out of Detroit. So I really got to hustle. Yeah. There. Okay. Well, if you would like to. Uh, Reach the show and uh, talk with John about Grease Fires. Yeah, let's, let's leave it at that. Or anything else, I suppose. I mean, he's willing to field questions. Yeah, grass. My grass is doing phenomenally. Yeah. yeah. Yes, grass and smoking. Mm-hmm. Um, Not combined. <laughs> you can reach us on Twitter at V and S pod. Email the show, various and sundry podcast at gmail.com. We're on Facebook and YouTube, and we would appreciate you leaving a five-star rating. Then you can say whatever you want in the review. Yeah, but the five stars. That's what matters. Mm-hmm. All right, John, let's talk a little sports. Okay. Uh, I'd say the main focus, NBA playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's start with your Knicks. Yeah, 2-2. Two, two. Yeah. And we're recording on a Monday morning, so mm-hmm. yesterday was a – was it was a dumpster fire? For yeah, the a bit of a shellacking. Um, they're not at full strength. I think they lost th- the Robinson guy, right? They lost Robinson, but they lost him before the series. Um, that was really a Joel Embiid casualty. Mm-hmm. Uh, we lost OG Ananobe, which okay. I think I'm pronouncing correctly. I'm sure Lee will let me know <laughs> if I'm not. Um, but uh, we lost him to a hamstring, and he, he apparently is getting treatments three or four times a day right now. Okay. And hopes that he comes back. So he has he was in the two games we won in the series and he's been out of the two games we lost. And he's a he's a defensive force. Um okay. can guard four positions, almost almost five positions on the floor and hmm. almost always has a positive uh positive uh number. Well, I don't know what you call that. Plus uh, minus? D- yeah, plus minus. Almost always positive. Okay. So we just need him back. Yeah. Uh by the way, I forgot to mention this in the intro. Did you get the email about they're testing the fire alarms on campus today? Maybe. Okay. 
I feel like I should mention that. I haven't sat at my computer yet today. So. Just in the event that a fire alarm goes off in the middle of the podcast. Do we have to leave? Or No, we okay, don't have okay, to okay. leave. No, no, no. So anyway. Uh, so, oh, yeah. Look at that. There you go. Yep. Uh, also in the Eastern Conference, uh, Celtics and Cavs at 2-1. Celtics up 2-1. Um, and uh, in the West – Weird series. Uh, Timberwolves and Nuggets. Timberwolves won the first two games in Denver by blowouts, basically, by at least 10 plus. And then Denver's won the And then Denver has won both games in Minnesota. It's kind of the opposite of the by double digits. Knicks Pacer series. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, very weird series there. And then the Mavs and the the Thunder tied at two games apiece as well. So. I, I'm just glad these series are competitive. I, I, I'm least optimistic about the Celtics, Cavs. I think, yeah, the Celtics will close that out in five. The other series look like they should go at least six. I would think, mm-hmm. and maybe seven. Yeah. So I'm I'm hoping that that's the case, uh, just for sheer entertainment. Um, and then the NBA draft lottery was yesterday. Oh, I didn't follow this very closely. Yeah. So I don't know where your Knicks fell, but uh, they're, they're not in the lottery. Sure. But um, they uh, – so first pick is going to go to the Hawks, followed by the Wizards, followed by the Rockets, followed by the Spurs. Nice. I, I don't know what to say about the draft lottery. I'm I not sure know, what the talent pool's like. I don't or, know either. Like, it just seems like more and more – uh, teams are going after either international players or guys that didn't go to college. Like that yeah. went, went these alternative routes like played somewhere professionally or semi-professionally because they can't go straight from high school into the draft. Uh, and then – so yeah. And given how much players even move within college basketball, I feel like it's just kind of hard to even identify like who's going to be good. Oh, yeah. So anyway, just uh, – that was just more of an FYI. Let's talk about your Mets. Any <sighs> – Struggling right now. I mean yeah. probably the most exciting part has been we called up a 20, 22, 23-year-old pitcher, uh, Christian Scott, and he's been great. He's he's allowed less than three runs in each of his first two starts, throws 96, 97, has what they call a sweeper. You familiar with this pitch, the sweeper? Is it a variation of a curveball or a slider? It's like a slider, but it's just much, much further. Like it's much, much more aggressive. Is it side to side movement or is it uh, mostly side to side movement? Okay, mostly side to side movement, and it just it starts in the zone and it ends up like six, eight inches off the plate. Yeah, like like and guys are just constantly fooled by it. Um, yeah, it's just a saucer, flying saucer thrown up there. It's pretty crazy what professional baseball players can do with a baseball. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the the amount they can make that thing move, like and it, within sixty feet. I mean, it's sixty feet six you have inches. Sixty yeah. feet six inches. I mean, it's actually less by the time you think about where they release the ball when they stride forward, right off the mound. Yeah. So called extension. They measure that now. Yeah. So really, it's what like it's probably several feet of extension by the time. Mm-hmm. You, so really, you're talking like fifty six feet. Yeah. Like, and, and to be able to hit it is you know, and pick up whether unreal. it's a a curveball, whether it's a fastball, splitter, yeah. changeup. So and, and you have to decide in less than less than a second. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's like it's like what like point four sec point four seconds or something. You you essentially have to make your decision like am uh-huh. I swinging at this? Yeah. That's wild. So uh, this guy has come up. He's been a, he's been awesome to watch, and he's like talking to himself on the mound constantly. He gave up a home run in his last week. He goes, okay, 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 let's go. <laughs> he's just looking for another ball to, to throw to the next guy, you know. And he's just totally unfazed. It's, it's kind of fun. Uh, okay. He's just wildly confident. Uh, so that's been a lot of fun. We, we've hit a tough stretch, though. We're not hitting well. We're not, uh, we're not playing super well. So mm-hmm. hopefully, hopefully we can pick that up. The, the start of the season is our hardest part of the schedule. Okay. Um, and once we get some pitching back, uh, Kodai Senga comes back with his ghost fork ball. <laughs> I don't know who that is. Kodai Senga? Oh, yeah. You need to look up Kodai Senga. <laughs> okay. Go look up uh, some Kodai Senga videos. Um, 
uh, yeah, he, he's is, is he of Japanese descent? Yeah, he's Japanese. Okay. Yeah, um, he has a translator who who has not stolen mil- millions from him um, <laughs> that we're aware of, um, as far as we know. So, yeah, um, but yeah, they're 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 a fun team to watch, but they're they're in a tough stretch right now, and they're in a tough division. So, okay. Anything else in the world of sports? That's I all I got. I don't think so. I came across a new sport this week. A new sport. What's a new that? sport. Uh, Goal ball? Have you heard of goal ball before? I don't think so. So I I went to visit one of our alum who uh, uh, is the COO of a not-for-profit organization that works with Paralympics. Hmm. Um, did you know Fort Wayne has one of nine Paralympic sites in the United States? I did not. Isn't that wild? And they specialize. Like I met members of the uh, women's Olympic team uh, in goal ball. Okay. So goal ball, let me try to just – first of all, Google it. But um, three on three and uh, you wear – it's meant for blind people. And so people that are a part of it have to wear uh, visors that block their vision entirely. Okay. So uh, – and then the goal spans the whole uh, – if it's a volleyball – if you could think of a volleyball court. Okay. It spans the whole back end all of right. each side. Like the baseline basically. Yeah, yeah. And then – uh, the ball is almost like a hollowed-out basketball filled with bells. With bells. With bells. So right. when you throw it, it just makes a ton of noise. Right. And then you have – so you can't see. All you can do is hear the lines all have like this thin rope taped down all the way around the outside so you can feel where you are. And there's a whole lot of other rules. But basically your your desire is to throw this ball in a way to get it past the other three to score a goal on the other team. Okay. And they do everything they can to stop it while not being able to see. Hmm. And so they're diving in front of balls and, and doing all sorts of things. And then they pick it up and throw it back. Okay. And this is part of the Paralympics. So how how long is the is the court? Um it's a probably probably a few few yards shorter than a basketball court. Okay. So it's it's fair. Uh, maybe volleyball court might be might be closer, but it's it's a pretty intense little sport. I was I was online watching videos after <laughs> I walked in. He goes, "Yeah, so this person uh, has four silver medals, and that one has two. Went, wow. wow! And they're we got to talk to them. They're like going to Rio. They're doing all these things. Wow! It's very cool. Huh? The men's team from Fort Wayne made the Paris Olympics, so they'll be at the the Paris Olympics. There you go." Uh, coming up here this summer. All right. I sorry about that, but that's just, anything no. else in sports. That's no. what it, that's what was on the Maybe mind. Maybe we need to get our uh, VNS Pod sports correspondent uh, on 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 uh, onto this. Yeah. Well, the other thing they say is because it's a uh, audio based game, mm-hmm. right? The crowd that watches it is silent. Silent. Yeah. And then when a goal happens. They just erupt and go absolutely insane. Uh, there's a tournament in August in Fort Wayne uh, with a bunch of teams from around the world that we should totally go to. <laughs> okay. I think it'd be a lot of fun. In August. In August, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. So, yeah, just yeah. something. I mean, when you have Olympians. I. That's true. That's kind of fun. That's right. All right. Didn't see it going there. Uh, how could you? Uh, yeah. How could I? All right. I also want to remind our listeners about our summer read. We will be reading through Patrick Schreiner's book, The Transfiguration of Christ, an exegetical and theological reading. So go ahead and grab your copy. Can we start that next week? Uh, The next episode will be chapters, uh, I think we said, well, introduction chapters one and two, right? Okay. I think that's what we said. Um, Okay. Uh, I've got it mapped out somewhere. I think that's right. Okay. Um, so make sure you pick up a copy of that. It's going on the trip with me. So yeah. it's in the bag. It's packed. There you go. There you go. All right, John, you ready for our main topic today? Sure, sure, sure. All right. Today we are discussing an article by Jake Meter. This came out back in uh, January. January. 
The, the title of the article is Reflections on the Evangelical Fracturing 10 Years In. And so this is published at Mere Orthodoxy, uh, not behind a paywall. So we'll have a link in the uh, show notes for you to check it out. But uh, yeah, let's talk. Let me try to give just a very brief overview, big picture of what he's trying to do, and then we'll talk specifics. So in this article, he is largely focused on Acts 29. Mm Mm-hmm the church planting network and kind of using that as a paradigm for seeing uh, the the fracturing of the evangelical movement. Mm-hmm. And um, he, he talks about it in th- from three different primary uh, angles in terms of what led to this fracturing. Um, and he – his headings are technology, the use of technology and perhaps misuse of it, uh, leadership failure, and then leadership styles. So that's the big picture here. Um, so I don't know if you want to say anything else in general terms before we start diving into some of the specifics of the article um, or if you're content to just start diving into some of the specifics. Why don't we? Why don't we? He kind of uses Driscoll, Chandler, Darren Patrick mm-hmm. as like the archetypes. Is that a, is that a like, sure. like like representative? And then sort of on the older generation, the Kellers and Piper, D. A. Carson a little bit as well. Yeah. So within the intro, he talks about those three figures: Driscoll, Darren Patrick, and uh, Matt Chandler, all of whom were one point at least, uh, either led Acts 29 or like – Or very influential. Very influential. influential, yeah. And he does in essence kind of compare them to figures in particular Keller and Piper um, and a little bit of Don Carson. Yeah, he mentions a, a Don sprinkle, Carson. Yeah. Uh, just, just a little dash of Don. <laughs> <laughs> a little dash of DA in there. Um, so – Yes. Uh, I, I'm guessing most of our listeners are probably familiar with Driscoll and probably Matt Chandler. Mm-hmm. Maybe some of them are not as familiar with Darren Patrick. So what, have, were you familiar with Darren Patrick mm-hmm. before coming to this article? Oh, what, yeah, yeah. What, what's your memories of Darren? Like how, how did you come to know Darren Patrick? Well, just because I, I knew he was at the helm or near the near the top of Acts 29 and had a – yeah. Uh, so he was at a church in the St. Louis area that had satellites and extensions and all that kind of stuff. So, I be, I became familiar. He wrote a book called Church Planter. Mm-hmm. That was the first time I think I encountered him. And uh, I knew he was in was it St. Louis. Yeah. He had a, had a large church in St. Louis, um, mm-hmm. but uh, left that church. And I don't know what happened to him afterward. I mean, I I know eventually what happened to them. Um, tragically, he he took his own life. Yeah, he took his own life. Um, I think in S- South Carolina is that where he's. I don't know where that happened, but I know. Yeah, it, it, the the article focuses a little bit less on him, though he's in here more. It, it's it tries to frame so Driscoll was the like uh, big personality. Um, how did he frame it here? Um, I want to get the wording here. Uh, Driscoll represented the kind of alpha figure who could draw a crowd, win a following, and define the direction of the network through sheer charisma and force of will. Mm-hmm. Uh, Darren Patrick represented a more cerebral and patient voice who was in many ways ahead of his time in his analysis of cultural issues as well as being more balanced in his approach than many of today's commentators. And then Matt Chandler was the more personable balance to Driscoll. Driscoll would deliver the bodies behind the bus type speech and Chandler could then come in behind to help patch up whatever relational issues were created by Driscoll's harsh style. (laughs) So 
he's he's seeing each of them as kind of yeah archetypes within the Acts twenty nine movement, and trying to assess how did Acts twenty nine essentially fall apart, mm-hmm. uh, even with these three kind of lead guys, and and a little bit how how the the movement that Acts twenty nine sort of represents. Mm-hmm. Uh, it certainly is in the Young Restless Reform Movement. I don't think it's yeah. the entirety of it. No. But it's certainly in it. Uh, how that um, group f- really, really came to pieces. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think what he said was pretty astute when he when he mentions like, hey, they have the theological foundation and uh, sort of the, the acumen of Piper and Keller – with sort of the missional ideas of sort of the Warrens and the Bill Hybels. There's yes. sort of a melding of the two. And I thought – I had never heard that before, but that makes a lot of sense to me. Yes. Um, but he also is quick to point out like these guys had audiences, what, by the time they were 35? Oh, even younger than that in some cases. Um, and, you know, he, he makes the point that Piper doesn't give the – don't waste your life. Passion talk until he's fifty-two. Is that right? Yeah, but he had published Desiring God ten years before that. And then, um, okay, so forty-two. Mm-hmm. Keller published his first book at fifty-eight. I think that's right. And Don's been. Uh, let's leave Don out of that part of the conversation because <laughs> Don's been publishing for a long, long time. Yes, but he he makes the point like these guys got a platform super super young and super super early. Yeah, yeah, and so I mean I think one obvious takeaway from this and, and one thing that Meter uh, emphasizes is you know just the dangers of and the difficulties of guys getting a big platform at such young ages before they are ready for it before mm-hmm. their spirit. Before their spiritual maturity is ready for it. Oh yeah, um, and that by contrast, as you pointed out, with guys like uh, Piper and Keller, they had had fifteen to twenty to twenty-five years of pastoral ministry under their belt before people really knew who they were outside of their like immediate. You know, uh, metropolitan area. Yeah, and so um, that makes a big difference. So, oh, yeah. so part of this article uh, gets at the the failure of passing on the leadership mm-hmm. of the sort of Acts twenty nine, but really the young restless reformed kind of, and specifically movement. frames it around boomers handing the baton to Gen Xers. Yes, yeah. My uh, my generation takes a hit here. Yeah. <laughs> what do you make of that? Is that too sweeping of a statement to say boomer to Gen X? Uh, because that, those are big, big categories. Is that too sweeping in your mind? I don't think it's too sweeping necessarily. But you know, I, I'm also going to say um, the boomers still bear some of the responsibility for um, not – not recognizing the lack of spiritual maturity mm-hmm. in some of these men and trying to – and being attracted to, wow, they can draw the crowd and they seem like they're theologically solid-ish. Mm-hmm. So let's give them a platform. Yeah. And, and I know – I mean obviously Driscoll is the big, the big fish there. Uh, but and – and I know that guys like – Piper and others behind the scenes were trying to like rein Driscoll in, um, but it it didn't work. It didn't work, <laughs> and you know, there's just a challenge there. I think because I think the desire to pass the baton is good to mm-hmm. the next generation, but if you're too if you're too enamored with giftings and charisma and personality and not uh, as aware of spiritual maturity or lack thereof, you know, that's a problem. That's a real problem. Hmm. Um, One of the interesting things uh, that that Meter mentions in this is that 
this group of, of leaders emerged in a period that's kind of weird in that podcasting or like being able to post your sermons essentially online so that anybody could listen to them yeah. had helped launch these men's larger platform. Oh, yeah. But it was before social media. Mm-hmm. And part of the point he makes, which I thought was interesting, is that for all of the awfulness of social media, which he acknowledges, one effect of it is to be able to give immediate pushback on things that might need immediate pushback Yeah. before these huge platforms grew. So I don't know. I think that's a fair assessment of – so it was just a weird transitional period in technology that they hit. Yeah. When, when did Driscoll plant Marcel? Was it 99? Right, right, around, right. right around 2000. Because um, when I came – so uh, Jake and I are about the same age, uh, meters and I. And because when I came across Driscoll for the first time, I was 2008, 2009. I think that's pretty much when I got a Twitter account. So by 2010, 2011, 2012, I'm in seminary, and Driscoll's a really, really big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, now there were I, – I don't think there was a ton of people pushing back on him at that point. From what I remember, in part because this is right in the wheelhouse of Rob Bell coming out with his Love Wins book. Yeah. Uh, and there was a lot of pushback given to that guy. Right. Who also had a church called Morris Hill, interestingly yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lesson, don't name your church. <laughs> um, but I, my goodness, I do remember like you could go on there and you could find any sermon, mm-hmm. any sermon uh, of yeah. his. And yeah. and Keller was near impossible to find his stuff. Well, he put it up behind a paywall. You had to pay for it. Yeah. 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 Something I, I was not willing to do. Um, I know they used to sell flash drives for like 200 bucks that you could get all of his sermons. Yeah. And they would mail you a flash drive, which is like the most <laughs> – which even in 2009, 2010 felt like a really low-tech yeah. uh, solution. Yeah. But even Piper's sermons I don't think were that easy to come across. By then? I don't know. I, I guess I don't know when that window started of them basically just posting them as downloadable – um, you know, MP3s or whatever. But, but I, I remember, I remember when Twitter was really taken off in like 2011, 2012. Driscoll was the most followed Christian on Twitter. Yeah, I believe that. Um, so I, I know he kind of says that social media wasn't around in the article, and but that, by then the platform was already established. It was established. His yeah. point, I think, in the article is, as the platforms were being built, there wasn't that. Mm-hmm. But um, but I think it I accelerated think, it. Yeah. I, I think it was like gasoline yeah. on a fire. I don't think um, – I think when Driscoll published his marriage book is I think is when that – when the pushback really started. Yeah, 2013? Uh, maybe even earlier, 12, maybe 12. 12. OK. Because the whole Mars Hill thing was 2014 when it just – when it fell apart. Oh, yeah. But the marriage book was part of that, right? Because they were manipulating the New York Times bestseller list. Because Mars Hill was yeah, ordering Yeah, that didn't a, come out. I, I think it took – That came out like 18 months later? I think so. OK. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. Um, so I think that um, you know, Meter tries to throw him a bone and say uh, a strong case can be made that no one labored in a more spiritually dangerous digital environment than Gen X pastors in the early 2000s. I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, with, with the way that Twitter works today, yeah, I don't know. I'm not as sure about that. Um, but uh, so, in addition to um, to that, he he does talk about leadership uh, leadership failure, mm-hmm. um, and this is where he talks about how both. Piper and Keller worked were able to work behind the scenes in their circles to try to prevent certain controversies from blowing up and, and obliterating the movement kind of thing. Yeah. And that uh, that just didn't happen or really couldn't perhaps happen with, with these individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But what did you make? I want to get to the leadership styles here. He he talks about two different types. He he talks about thought leaders, which he describes as they're people fo- uh, more focused on ideas. Uh, this is where people in media, nonprofit spaces, or denominational leadership positions naturally drift because they will spend much of their work day online consuming content, uh, content and discussing ideas. Additionally, because many of the jobs will be based on uh, will be based in blue cities, people in these fields will have daily experiences of trying to maintain relationship with progressives while being faithful which will shape them in certain ways and also define their concerns and priorities. Uh, And then he talks about, on the other hand, you've got people leaders. Uh, these These tend to be pastors in local churches, specifically pastors in either red states or more extreme progressive regions where the underlying conflicts with the successor ideology were far more explicit. These folks spend their days dealing with the ordinary struggles of parish life and pastoral care. These people tend to be organization builders of various sorts, highly entrepreneurial, and as a result, they tend to encounter the practical manifestations of ideology sooner than thought leaders do. I thought that's an interesting and important point. Yeah. Um, So... Thoughts on that, those those categories? I I think he I I don't know how many th- I don't know how much like decisive thought I have on this. I think he's probably right mm-hmm. that there are these people in I mean I mean in higher ed institutions, think tanks, not for profits, who are engaging the ideas and not mm-hmm. running into the ideology on the street, so to speak. Uh, I think that's right, and I think. Some of the pastors on the ground are running into some of these ideologies a whole lot, a lot more frequently. Yeah, I think I I, I think that distinction is. And I do think there's an an important distinction in there too, in the, um, in the thought leader crowd, where if you're embedded in that sort of blue city progressive context, that you are probably faced with more temptation to try to bring together Christianity and the gospel with progressive thought in Mm -hmm. some sort of way that you think will be at least um, hearable to your progressive uh, audience. Mm -hmm. Whereas either in a red context or in a so dark blue that that there's just no there's no hope there, there's <laughs> I won't say no hope but but there's no chance of trying to play nice with the progressives in the hope that maybe they'll at least like you enough to hear you out yeah that the that it's just so hardened that there's no like no no matter how much you try to make it palatable to palatable to me mm-hmm. I won't listen there's very little relationship there yeah. To begin with, mm-hmm. yeah, um, I think that's probably onto something there. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what's interesting though is um, I would say, ironically, in some ways, there's a similar dynamic on the far right mm-hmm. that there can be such an extreme right end of things that you get to a point where, no matter how winsomely I try to present the true gospel, you're going to reject it for some f- for some distortion or some nationalism or some sort mm-hmm. of extreme view there. So I think it ends up working out on both ends of the spectrum that he doesn't necessarily address here, Th- though I do think he's trying to give a history of how this happened. So I think that piece on the far right is more recent. That feels newer. Recent. Yeah, that feels way newer. <clears throat> so – but no, I think that's a good observation. I I do think that is happening on on the right um, mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's a lot more in here. This is a r- lengthy read. Um, it is. It's a long, long read. But it's worth it, I think, just to help track how did the evangelical movement kind of fracture apart 
uh, I think, by taking one specific example in Acts 29. And then I think before – I think after this came out actually, there was some stat I saw that Acts 29 in the last like year or two had lost over half of its churches. Yeah. That they'd left the network. Yeah, it, it's It went from apart. like 500 plus to like 200 plus. Yep. That's staggering in, in like a, a one or two year period. It's smaller than the Karis Fellowship at this point. So it's it's just really remarkable. Um, or uh, r- roughly the same size, I should say, as the Karis Fellowship. So let's – any big picture takeaways that we – um, this might be one that I return to every now and then to to sort of refresh and see how these trends continue to play out. Yeah, I I, I think I think that that may be what I do with this article. I'm, I don't totally know what to do. Like the the thought leader versus the people leader. I think that's a um, helpful dynamic to to have a grid for that. Mm-hmm. We didn't go into it, but he goes further into like uh, different. I don't even know how to categorize them, but he goes into a, a Yale professor's grid of thinking. Mm-hmm. We need to get into that, and I'm not sure I totally understand it. Uh, <laughs> Was that the like the six categories of? No, that there was. There was a different link in there to an article I think we've done actually. Like the six, the six yes, different the categories that, that Kevin even, De Young, yeah, the six yeah. that evangelicalism is broken into. You're not thinking about that. No, one. the uh, uh, talking about the Hauerwas one. The no, Hauerwas I'm talking one? about the Lind- Lindbeck. Lindbeck, George Lindbeck, yeah, yeah, okay, uh, stuff. Gotcha. Um, he goes into that. I'm, I, I need to go through that again and again. Yeah. I, I'm not sure I totally have a full grasp of what he's trying to get at there. Yeah, I do think, regardless of some of the specifics. Since we are in the business of helping to train the next generation of ministry leaders, um, I think this is yet another sort of cautionary tale of not becoming so enamored with gifting and abilities Oh yeah, that we lose sight of growth and godliness, mm-hmm. and that, that a person has the, re- the requisite character to handle – uh, whatever measure of platform the Lord gives, and that the pursuit of a platform is not good. That you know, men like Piper and Keller didn't pursue platforms; they just did their ministry, and a platform arose around them because of their track record. Mm-hmm. This generation is tempted, I think, to pursue the platform. And hope that the character catches up. <laughs> and you know, I, I want to be gracious in that it is – I think it's hard to put ourselves in that situation of when you have uh, – actually, this is related to something. I was, my wife and I this weekend, we watched an inter- interview with John Bon Jovi. Oh, fun. Uh, fascinating. And I'm sitting there and I'm seeing the clips of, of him performing in these, you know, football stadiums. Yeah. There's 75, 80,000 people there. And to one degree or another, they are in essence almost worshiping Absolutely. Him and his band as they're playing. How does that not go to your head? Oh, yeah. How does that not make you arrogant? I mean, could you imagine being 30 years old and having – I mean, how, how big was Driscoll's church? I mean, 10,000? Probably. Like, but then going to, going to conferences potentially. Like and having these, another five show up. Yeah. yeah. Speaking to fifteen or 20,000 college students or whatever. Like, yeah. And they're hanging on your every word. Yep. Like, how does that not feed your ego? Yeah. And so I, I just think – there is a there's a warning there that we have to be careful even in training young men and women for ministry that they need to put the work in to grow in their godliness so that whatever man, manner of platform God gives them they can handle it and part of that comes from also having people around them that are not just yes men not just there for the ride they're willing to call you out and say what you said there, that was wrong. That was well, arrogant. Well, and to have Don't good accountability structures around you. Yeah. 
like uh, I'll never forget that from the Mars Hill uh, podcast that Cosper did, right? Mm-hmm. Keller would is in a denominational structure where people could question him and his overseer, I don't know the proper term in Presbyterian circles, would come to him and say, hey, these questions are being asked of you. Mm-hmm. And he would have to give an answer. Yeah. Uh, you know, the people need those accountability structures in place. It doesn't have to be exactly like that. I'm not advocating for Presbyterianism. But <laughs> you need some sort of accountability structures in place where where somebody has some authority over you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. got to move on here, John. Okay. Time now for This Day in Sports History. This Day in Sports History, 19th, May 14th. Yeah. 1913, Washington Senator Walter Johnson ends MLB record scoreless streak at 56 innings. That's a long time. Yeah. Uh, at first, I was not sure if that was the team or his position in Congress. <laughs> Yes, fifty six innings. Yeah, long so, time. Do you I, when you look at some of those records from that time period? Mm-hmm. Do you find yourself thinking, "How do I evaluate this?" Yes, because most of these guys, yeah, they're professional athletes, but they're also like in the off season, they're working in the steel factory, mm-hmm. or they're selling insurance, yep. or they're doing something like that. So they're not at the same level in in terms of professionalization. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Anyway, uh, 1972 in Willie Mays' first game as a New York Met. Love that. Uh, his homer beat San Francisco Giants five to four. His former team for over 20 years at Shea Stadium, New York. That was a great I don't moment. think I knew that he played for the Mets. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So did uh, Joe Torre played for the Mets for a time also. Hmm. Uh, 1975. Uh, Oh boy, uh, Di- Dynamo, sure, Keith of the Soviet Union wins fifteenth European Cup Winners Cup. Your Soviet Union wins fifteenth European Cup Winners Cup. Okay, over uh, <laughs> for Novikar OCTC of Hungary three zero. I, I have no idea if I pronounced any of those correctly. Neither do I. Okay. Uh, 1989, Minnesota Twins Kirby Puckett uh, becomes first player to hit six doubles across two consecutive games in St. Louis Cardinal Red. Oh, boy. Uh, Show and Dynast? Show and Dienst. Show and Dienst in 1948. Six doubles across two consecutive games. Wow. Uh, 2017, PGA Player Championship. Uh, TPC Sawgrass, uh, 21-year-old South Korean Kim Si-woo shoots his final round, 69 to win by three strokes ahead of Louis, oh gosh, uh, Oosthuizen. I, I Oosthuizen. No Oosthuizen, there we go, and Ian Poulter. There you go. Uh, 2018, Supreme Court strikes down federal law banning sports gambling in most states. And the world is worse for it. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Out of that whole list, that is obviously the most historically significant event. Yeah. Without question. I'm not saying we should go with that. I'm just saying, historically speaking, that will be by far the most significant. Yeah. I say we name the podcast, you know, our, our first two, and then sports yeah. gambling, you know, sports gambling, and make it make it almost sound like we're making an announcement that we're partnering with, okay, Bet MGM or something. There you go. <laughs> there you go. We're gonna go with goal ball. Yes. <laughs> yes. The fracturing of evangelicalism <laughs> and sports gambling. Sports gambling. I love it. That's our episode <laughs> title. Okay. That's wild. <laughs> okay. I love it. I love it. You, That's great. So do you want to go with that one as the uh, – Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. One thing you liked. Uh, I'm going to go with goal ball. <laughs> okay. I, I see yours and want to echo yours as well, but uh, but I'm – We've already kind of talked about mine as well, but I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to double back and add one to it. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mother's Day, obviously, yeah. great day, but I'm going to go with goal ball. That yeah. was probably the most unique part of my week for sure. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go with Mother's Day. That was already mentioned. Um, our boys were not home for that, but Kate and I had a lovely day. 
Um, and just grateful for the uh, terrific mom that she is um, to our boys. Uh, and I will actually add into that as well. Um, I found that that uh, one hour interview with John Bon Jovi actually very interesting. Hmm. Okay. So I mean, Bon Jovi, they they their rise to prominence was like right in my sweet spot of like junior high into high school. Hmm. So, and he's still alive, right, John Bon Jovi? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Many of those rock stars aren't. Yeah, he just recently had um, something happened to his vocal cords, basically, hmm. and he had to have surgery to uh, to fix that. But um, yeah, just fascinating to hear. I mean, from New Jersey, came from a very working class background, and uh, yeah, just interesting to see uh, his rise to you know rock star status. Nice. So, and that is my one thing I liked. All right, John, we have talked about goalball. I'm sending you a video later. Okay. You're, you're going to love it. All right. Uh, reminder uh, we'll start our summer read Patrick Schreiner, The Transfiguration of Christ, an exegetical and theological reading. So make sure you read chapter uh, intro and chapters one and two. We have talked evangelical fracturing, not fracting the oil process of extracting oil from difficult places, right? Yep. Fra- yep, fra- yep. It's called fracting, right? Uh, uh, fracking. Fracking. There's That's no T. What it is. No T. Yeah. Fracking. There you go. Thanks for the assistance. I have to per- correct your pronunciation just all the time. All the, the time. Pod- on the podcast, yeah. Uh, we have talked sports gambling. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have talked gold ball again. Of course, yeah. And we have talked Mother's Day and an documentary on John Bon Jovi and so I think by definition we have covered our various and sundry topics so all that's left to say is until next time the Lord bless y'all real good later later